Section 8 of An Essay Concerning Human Understanding by John Locke. Book 4 of Knowledge and Probability. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Henry. Chapter 7 of Maxims. 1. Maxims, or axioms, are self-evident propositions. There are a sort of propositions which, under the name of maxims and axioms, have passed for principles of science, and because they are self-evident, have been supposed innate, without that anybody that I know ever went about to show the reason and foundation of their clearness or cogency. It may, however, be worth while to inquire into the reason of their evidence and see whether it be peculiar to them alone, and also to examine how far they influence and govern our other knowledge. 2. Wherein that self-evidence consists. Knowledge, as has been shown, consists in the perception of the agreement or disagreement of ideas. Now where that agreement or disagreement is perceived immediately by itself, without the intervention or help of any other, there our knowledge is self-evident. This will appear to be so to any who will but consider any of those propositions which, without any proof, he assents to at first sight, for in all of them he will find that the reason of his assent is from that agreement or disagreement which the mind, by an immediate comparing them, finds in those ideas answering the affirmation or negation in the proposition. 3. Self-evidence not peculiar to received axioms. This being so, in the next place let us consider whether this self-evidence be peculiar only to those propositions which commonly pass under the name of maxims and have the dignity of axioms allowed them. And here it is plain that several other truths not allowed to be axioms partake equally with them in this self-evidence. This we shall see if we go over these several sorts of agreement or disagreement of ideas which I have above mentioned, viz. identity, relation, coexistence, and real existence, which will discover to us that not only those few propositions which have had the credit of maxims are self-evident, but a great many, even almost an infinite number of other propositions are such. 4. As to identity and diversity, all propositions are equally self-evident. 1. For first, the immediate perception of the agreement or disagreement of identity being founded in the mind's having distinct ideas, this affords us as many self-evident propositions as we have distinct ideas. Everyone that has any knowledge at all has as the foundation of it various and distinct ideas, and it is the first act of the mind, without which it can never be capable of any knowledge, to know every one of its ideas by itself and distinguish it from others. Every one finds in himself that he knows the ideas he has, that he knows also when any one is in his understanding and what it is, and that when more than one are there, he knows them distinctly and unconfusedly, one from another. Which always being so, it being impossible but that he should perceive what he perceives, he can never be in doubt when any idea is in his mind, that it is there, and is that idea it is, and that two distinct ideas, when they are in his mind, are there, and are not one and the same idea, so that all such affirmations and negations are made without any possibility of doubt, uncertainty, or hesitation, and must necessarily be assented to as soon as understood, that is, as soon as we have in our minds determined ideas which the terms in the proposition stand for. And therefore, Whenever the mind with attention considers any proposition so as to perceive the two ideas signified by the terms, 
and affirmed or denied one of the other to be the same or different, it is presently and infallibly certain of the truth of such a proposition. And this equally, whether these propositions be in terms standing for more general ideas, or such as are less so, v.g., whether the general idea of being be affirmed of itself, as in this proposition, whatsoever is, is, or a more particular idea be affirmed of itself, as a man is a man, or whatsoever is white is white, or whether the idea of being in general be denied of not being, which is the only, if I may so call it, idea different from it, as in this other proposition, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, or any idea of any particular being be denied of another different from it, as a man is not a horse, red is not blue. The difference of the ideas, as soon as the terms are understood, makes the truth of the proposition presently visible, and that with an equal certainty and easiness in the less as well as the more general propositions, and all for the same reason, viz because the mind perceives in any ideas that it has the same idea to be the same with itself, and to different ideas to be different and not the same, and this it is equally certain of, whether these ideas be more or less general, abstract, and comprehensive. It is not, therefore, alone to these two general propositions, whatsoever is, is, and it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, that this sort of self-evidence belongs by any peculiar right. The perception of being or not being belongs no more to these vague ideas, signified by the terms whatsoever and thing, than it does to any other ideas, these two general maxims amounting to no more, in short, but this, that the same is the same, and the same is not different, are truths known in more particular instances, as well as in those general maxims, and known also, in particular instances, before these general maxims are ever thought on, and draw all their force from the discernment of the mind employed about particular ideas. There is nothing more visible than that the mind without the help of any proof or reflection on either of these general propositions perceives so clearly and knows so certainly that the idea of white is the idea of white and not the idea of blue, and that the idea of white, when it is in the mind, is there and is not absent, that the consideration of these axioms can add nothing to the evidence or certainty of its knowledge. Just so it is, as everyone may experiment in himself, in all the ideas a man has in his mind, he knows each to be itself and not to be another, and to be in his mind and not away when it is there with a certainty that cannot be greater, and therefore the truth of no general proposition can be known with a greater certainty, nor add anything to this, so that, in respect of identity, our intuitive knowledge reaches as far as our ideas, and we are capable of making as many self-evident propositions as we have names for distinct ideas. And I appeal to everyone's own mind whether this proposition, a circle is a circle, be not as self-evident a proposition as that consisting of more general terms, whatsoever is, is, and again whether this proposition, blue is not red, be not a proposition that the mind can no more doubt of as soon as it understands the words than it does of that axiom it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, and so of all the like. 5. In coexistence we have few self-evident propositions. 2. Secondly, as to coexistence, or such a necessary connection between two ideas that in the subject where one of them is supposed 
there the other must necessarily be also, of such agreement or disagreement as this, the mind has an immediate perception, but in very few of them, and therefore in this sort we have but very little intuitive knowledge. Nor are there to be found very many propositions that are self-evident, though some there are. V.G. The idea of filling a place equal to the contents of its superficies, being annexed to our idea of body, I think it is a self-evident proposition that two bodies cannot be in the same place. 6. 3. In other relations we may have many. Thirdly, as to the relations of modes, mathematicians have framed many axioms concerning that one relation of equality, as equals taken from equals, the remainder will be equal, which, with the rest of that kind, however they are received for maxims by the mathematicians, and are unquestionable truths, yet I think that any one who considers them will not find that they have a clearer self-evidence than these, that one and one are equal to two, that if you take from the five fingers of one hand two, and from the five fingers of the other hand two, the remaining numbers will be equal. These, and a thousand other such propositions, may be found in numbers, which, at the very first hearing, force the assent and carry with them an equal, if not greater clearness, than those mathematical axioms. 7. 4. Concerning real existence, we have none. Fourthly, as to real existence, since that has no connection with any other of our ideas but that of ourselves and of a first being, we have in that concerning the real existence of all other beings, not so much as demonstrative, much less a self-evident knowledge. And therefore, concerning those, there are no maxims. 8. These axioms do not much influence our other knowledge. In the next place, let us consider what influence these received maxims have upon the other parts of our knowledge. The rules established in the schools, that all reasonings are ex precognitis et preconcessis, seem to lay the foundation of all other knowledge in these maxims, and to suppose them to be precognita, whereby I think are meant these two things. First, that these axioms are those truths that are first known to the mind, and secondly, that upon them the other parts of our knowledge depend. 9. Because maxims, or axioms, are not the truths we first knew. First, that they are not the truths first known to the mind is evident to experience, as we have shown in another place. Book 1, Chapter 1. Who perceives not that a child certainly knows that a stranger is not its mother, that its sucking bottle is not the rod, long before he knows that it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. And how many truths are there about numbers which it is obvious to observe that the mind is perfectly acquainted with and fully convinced of before it ever thought on these general maxims to which mathematicians, in their arguings, do sometimes refer them, whereof the reason is very plain, for that which makes the mind assent to such propositions, being nothing else but the perception it has of the agreement or disagreement of its ideas, according as it finds them affirmed or denied one of another in words it understands, and every idea being known to be what it is, and every two distinct ideas being known not to be the same, it must necessarily follow that such self-evident truths must be first known which consist of ideas that are first in the mind, and the ideas first in the mind, it is evident, are those of particular things, from whence, by slow degrees, the understanding proceeds to some few general ones, which, 
being taken from the ordinary and familiar objects of sense, are settled in the mind with general names to them. Thus, particular ideas are first received and distinguished, and so knowledge got about them, and next to them, the less general or specific, which are next to particular. For abstract ideas are not so obvious or easy to children or the yet unexercised mind as particular ones. If they seem so to grown men, it is only because by constant and familiar use they are made so. For when we nicely reflect upon them, we shall find that general ideas are fictions and contrivances of the mind that carry difficulty with them and do not so easily offer themselves as we are apt to imagine. For example, does it not require some pains and skill to form the general idea of a triangle, which is yet none of the more abstract, comprehensive, and difficult? For it must be neither oblique nor rectangle, neither equilateral, equicrural, nor scalenon, but all and none of these at once. In effect, it is something imperfect that cannot exist, an idea wherein some part of several different and inconsistent ideas are put together. It is true, the mind, in this imperfect state, has need of such ideas, and makes all the haste to them it can, for the conveniency of communication and enlargement of knowledge, to both which it is naturally very much inclined. But yet, one has reason to suspect such ideas are marks of our imperfection. At least this is enough to show that the most abstract and general ideas are not those that the mind is first and most easily acquainted with, nor such as its earliest knowledge is conversant about. 10. Because on perception of them, the other parts of our knowledge do not depend. Secondly, from what has been said, it plainly follows that these magnified maxims are not the principles and foundations of all our other knowledge. For if there be a great many other truths, which have as much self-evidence as they, and a great many that we know before them, it is impossible they should be the principles from which we deduce all other truths. Is it impossible to know that one and two are equal to three, but by virtue of this or some such axiom, viz. the whole is equal to all its parts taken together? Many a one knows that one and two are equal to three without having heard or thought on that or any other axiom by which it might be proved, and knows it as certainly as any other man knows that the whole is equal to all its parts, or any other maxim, and all from the same reason of self-evidence, the equality of those ideas being as visible and certain to him without that or any other axiom as with it, it needing no proof to make it perceived nor after the knowledge that the whole is equal to all its parts, does he know that one and two are equal to three better or more certainly than he did before. For if there be any odds in those ideas, the whole and parts are more obscure, or at least more difficult to be settled in the mind than those of one, two, and three. And indeed, I think, I may ask these men who will needs have all knowledge, besides those general principles themselves, to depend on general, innate, and self-evident principles. What principle is requisite to prove that one and one are two, that two and two are four, that three times two are six, which being known without any proof do evince that either all knowledge does not depend on certain precognita or general maxims called principles, or else that these are principles, and if these are to be counted principles, a great part of numeration will be so, to which, if we add all the self-evident propositions which may be made about all our distinct ideas, principles will be almost infinite, at least innumerable, which men arrive to the knowledge of at different ages, and a great many of these innate principles they never come to know all their lives. 
But whether they come in view of the mind earlier or later, this is true of them, that they are all known by their native evidence, are wholly independent, receive no light, nor are capable of any proof one from another, much less the more particular from the more general, or the more simple from the more compounded, the more simple and less abstract being the most familiar, and the easier and earlier apprehended. But whichever be the clearest ideas, the evidence and certainty of all such propositions is in this, that a man sees the same idea to be the same idea, and infallibly perceives two different ideas to be different ideas. For when a man has in his understanding the ideas of one and of two, the idea of yellow and the idea of blue, he cannot but certainly know that the idea of one is the idea of one and not the idea of two, and that the idea of yellow is the idea of yellow and not the idea of blue. For a man cannot confound the ideas in his mind which he has distinct. That would be to have them confused and distinct at the same time, which is a contradiction. And to have none distinct is to have no use of our faculties, to have no knowledge at all. And therefore, what idea soever is affirmed of itself, or whatsoever two entire distinct ideas are denied one of another, the mind cannot but assent to such a proposition as infallibly true, as soon as it understands the terms, without hesitation or need of proof, or regarding those made in more general terms and called maxims. 11. What use these general maxims or axioms have? What shall we then say? Are these general maxims of no use? By no means though perhaps their use is not that which it is commonly taken to be. But since doubting in the least of what hath been by some men ascribed to these maxims may be apt to be cried out against as overturning the foundations of all the sciences, it may be worth while to consider them with respect to other parts of our knowledge and examine more particularly to what purposes they serve and to what not, of no use to prove less general propositions, nor as foundations on consideration of which any science has been built. 1. It is evident from what has been already said that they are of no use to prove or confirm less general self-evident propositions. 2. It is as plain that they are not, nor have been, the foundations whereon any science hath been built. There is, I know, a great deal of talk, propagated from scholastic men, of sciences and the maxims on which they are built. But it has been my ill luck never to meet with any such sciences, much less any one built upon these two maxims, what is, is, and it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, and I would be glad to be shown where any such science erected upon these or any other general axioms is to be found, and should be obligated to any one who would lay before me the frame and system of any science so built on these or any such like maxims that could not be shown to stand as firm without any consideration of them, I ask whether these general maxims have not the same use in the study of divinity and in theological questions that they have in other sciences. They serve here, too, to silence wranglers and put an end to dispute. But I think that nobody will therefore say that the Christian religion is built upon these maxims or that the knowledge we have of it is derived from these principles. It is from revelation we have received it, and without revelation these maxims had never been able to help us to it. When we find out an idea by whose intervention we discover the connection of two others, this is a revelation from God to us by the voice of reason, for we then come to know a truth that we did not know before. When God declares any truth to us, 
This is a revelation to us by the voice of His Spirit, and we are advanced in our knowledge. But in neither of these do we receive our light or knowledge from maxims, but in the one the things themselves afford it, and we see the truth in them by perceiving their agreement or disagreement. In the other, God himself affords it immediately to us, and we see the truth of what he says in his unerring veracity. 3. Nor as helps in the discovery of yet unknown truths. They are not of use to help men forward in the advancement of sciences or new discoveries of yet unknown truths. Mr. Newton, in his Never Enough to be Admired book, has demonstrated several propositions, which are so many new truths, before unknown to the world, and are further advances in mathematical knowledge. But for the discovery of these, it was not the general maxims, what is, is, or the whole is bigger than a part, or the like, that helped him. These were not the clues that led him into the discovery of the truth and certainty of those propositions. Nor was it by them that he got the knowledge of those demonstrations, but by finding out intermediate ideas that showed the agreement or disagreement of the ideas as expressed in the propositions he demonstrated. This is the greatest exercise and improvement of human understanding in the enlarging of knowledge and advancing the sciences, wherein they are far enough from receiving any help from the contemplation of these or the like magnified maxims. Would those who have this traditional admiration of these propositions that they think no step can be made in knowledge without the support of an axiom no stone laid in the building of the sciences without a general maxim, but distinguish between the method of acquiring knowledge and of communicating it, between the method of raising any science and that of teaching it to others as far as it is advanced. They would see that those general maxims were not the foundations on which the first discoverers raised their admirable structures, nor the keys that unlocked and opened those secrets of knowledge. Though afterwards, when schools were erected and sciences had their professors to teach what others had found out, they often made use of maxims, i.e. laid down certain propositions which were self-evident or to be received for true, which being settled in the minds of their scholars as unquestionable verities, they on occasion made use of to convince them of truths in particular instances that were not so familiar to their minds as those general axioms which had before been inculcated to them and carefully settled in their minds. Though these particular instances, when well reflected on, are no less self-evident to the understanding than the general maxims brought to confirm them. And it was in those particular instances that the first discoverer found the truth, without the help of the general maxims, and so may anyone else do who with attention considers them. Maxims of use in the exposition of what has been discovered, and in silencing obstinate wranglers. To come, therefore, to the use that is made of maxims. 1. They are of use, as has been observed, in the ordinary methods of teaching sciences as far as they are advanced, but of little or none in advancing them further. 2. They are of use in disputes, for the silencing of obstinate wranglers, and bringing those contests to some conclusion. Whether a need of them to that end came not in the manner following, I crave leave to inquire. The schools, having made disputation the touchstone of men's abilities and the criterion of knowledge, educated victory to him that kept the field, and he that had the last word was concluded to have the better of the argument, if not of the cause. But because by this means there was like to be no decision between skillful combatants, whilst one never failed of immediate terminus to prove any proposition, 
and the other could as constantly, without or with a distinction, deny the major or minor to prevent, as much as could be, running out of disputes into an endless train of syllogisms, certain general propositions, most of them indeed self-evident, were introduced into the schools, which, being such as all men allowed and agreed in, were looked on as general measures of truth, and served instead of principles where the disputants had not lain down any other between them, beyond which there was no going, and which must not be receded from by either side. And thus these maxims, getting the name of principles, beyond which men in dispute could not retreat, were by mistake taken to be the originals and sources from whence all knowledge began, and the foundations whereon the sciences were built. Because when in their disputes they came to any of these, they stopped there and went no further. The matter was determined. But how much this is a mistake hath already been shown. How maxims came to be so much in vogue. This method of the schools, which have been thought the fountains of knowledge, introduced, as I suppose, the like use of these maxims into a great part of conversation out of the schools, to stop the mouths of cavaliers, whom any one is excused from arguing any longer with, when they deny these general self-evident principles received by all reasonable men who have once thought of them. But yet their use herein is but to put an end to wrangling. They, in truth, when urged in such cases, teach nothing. That is already done by the intermediate ideas made use of in the debate, whose connection may be seen without the help of those maxims, and so the truth known before the maxim is produced, and the argument brought to a first principle. Men would give off a wrong argument before it came to that if in their disputes they proposed to themselves the finding and embracing of truth, and not a contest for victory. And thus maxims have their use to put a stop to their perverseness, whose ingenuity should have yielded sooner. But the method of the schools, having allowed and encouraged men to oppose and resist evident truth till they are baffled, i.e., till they are reduced to contradict themselves or some established principles, it is no wonder that they should not in civil conversation be ashamed of that which in the schools is counted a virtue and a glory, viz. obstinacy to maintain that side of the question they have chosen, whether true or false, to the last extremity, even after conviction, a strange way to attain truth and knowledge, and that which I think the rational part of mankind, not corrupted by education, could scarce believe should ever be admitted amongst the lovers of truth, and students of religion or nature, or introduced into the seminaries of those who are to propagate the truths of religion or philosophy amongst the ignorant and unconvinced. How much such a way of learning is like to turn young men's minds from the sincere search and love of truth, nay, and to make them doubt whether there is any such thing, or at least worth the adhering to, I shall not now inquire. This, I think, that baiting those places which brought the peripatetic philosophy into their schools, where it continued many ages, without teaching the world anything but the art of wrangling, these maxims were nowhere thought the foundations on which the sciences were built, nor the great helps to the advancement of knowledge. Of great use to stop wranglers in disputes, but of little use to the discovery of truths. As to these general maxims, therefore, they are, as I have said, of great use in disputes, to stop the mouths of wranglers, but not of much use to the discovery of unknown truths, or to help the mind forwards in its search after knowledge. For who ever began to build his knowledge on this general proposition? What is, is, or it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, and from either of these 
as from a principle of science, deduced a system of useful knowledge. Wrong opinions often involving contradictions, one of these maxims as a touchstone may serve well to show whither they lead, but yet however fit to lay open the absurdity or mistake of a man's reasoning or opinion, they are of very little use for enlightening the understanding, and it will not be found that the mind receives much help from them in its progress in knowledge, which would be neither less nor less certain, were these two general propositions never thought on. It is true, as I have said, they sometimes serve in argumentation to stop a wrangler's mouth by showing the absurdity of what he saith, and by exposing him to the shame of contradicting what all the world knows and he himself cannot but own to be true. But it is one thing to show a man that he is in an error, and another to put him in possession of truth. And I would fain know what truths these two propositions are able to teach and by their influence make us know which we did not know before or could not know without them. Let us reason from them as well as we can. They are only about identical predications and influence, if any at all, none but such. Each particular proposition concerning identity or diversity is as clearly and certainly known in itself, if attended to, as either of these general ones. Only these general ones, as serving in all cases, are therefore more inculcated and insisted on. As to other, less general maxims, many of them are no more than bare verbal propositions, and teach us nothing but the respect and import of names one to another. The whole is equal to all its parts. What real truth, I beseech you, does it teach us? What more is contained in that maxim than what the signification of the word totem, or the whole, does of itself import. And he that knows that the word whole stands for what is made up of all its parts, knows very little less than that the whole is equal to all its parts. And upon the same ground, I think that this proposition, a hill is higher than a valley, and several the like, may also pass for maxims. But yet, masters of mathematics, when they would, as teachers of what they know, initiate others in that science, do not, without reason, place this and some other such maxims at the entrance of their systems, that their scholars, having in the beginning perfectly acquainted their thoughts with these propositions, made in such general terms, may be used to make such reflections, and have these more general propositions, as formed rules and sayings, ready to apply to all particular cases. Not that if they be equally weighed, they are more clear and evident than the particular instances they are brought to confirm, but that, being more familiar to the mind, the very naming them is enough to satisfy the understanding. But this, I say, is more from our custom of using them, and the establishment they have got in our minds by our often thinking of them, than from the different evidence of the things. But before custom has settled methods of thinking and reasoning in our minds, I am apt to imagine it is quite otherwise, and that the child, when a part of his apple is taken away, knows it better in that particular instance than by this general proposition the whole is equal to all its parts, and that if one of these have need to be confirmed to him by the other, the general has more need to be let into his mind by the particular than the particular by the general. For in particulars our knowledge begins and so spreads itself by degrees to generals. Footnote this is the order in time of the conscious acquisition of knowledge that is human. The essay might be regarded as a commentary on this one sentence. Our intellectual progress is from particulars and involuntary recipiency, through reactive doubt and criticism, into what is at last reasoned faith. Though afterwards, 
the mind takes the quite contrary course, and having drawn its knowledge into as general propositions as it can, makes those familiar to its thoughts, and accustoms itself to have recourse to them as to the standards of truth and falsehood. Footnote. This is the philosophic attitude. Therein one consciously apprehends the intellectual necessities that were unconsciously presupposed. Its previous intellectual progress in philosophy we draw our knowledge into as general propositions as it can be made to assume and thus either learn to see it as an organic while in a speculative unity or learn that it cannot be so seen in a finite intelligence and that even at the last it must remain broken and mysterious in the human understanding. By which familiar use of them as rules to measure the truth of other propositions, it comes in time to be thought that more particular propositions have their truth and evidence from their conformity to these more general ones, which in discourse and argumentation are so frequently urged and constantly admitted. And this I think to be the reason why, amongst so many self-evident propositions, the most general only have had the title of maxims. 12. Maxims, if care not be taken in the use of words, may prove contradictions. One thing further, I think it may not be amiss to observe concerning these general maxims that they are so far from improving or establishing our minds in true knowledge that if our notions be wrong, loose, or unsteady, and we resign up our thoughts to the sound of words rather than fix them on settled, determined ideas of things, I say these general maxims will serve to confirm us in mistakes and in such a way of use of words which is most common, will serve to prove contradictions. V. G. He that with Descartes shall frame in his mind an idea of what he calls body to be nothing but extension, may easily demonstrate that there is no vacuum, i.e. no space void of body, by this maxim, what is, is. For the idea to which he annexes the name body being bare extension, his knowledge that space cannot be without body is certain. For he knows his own idea of extension clearly and distinctly, and knows that it is what it is, and not another idea, though it be called by these three names, extension, body, space, which three words standing for one and the same idea may no doubt with the same evidence and certainty be affirmed one of another as each of itself. And it is as certain that whilst I use them all to stand for one and the same idea, this predication is as true and identical in its signification that space is body, as this predication is true and identical, that body is body both in signification and sound. 13. Instance in vacuum. But if another should come and make to himself another idea, different from Descartes, of the thing which yet with Descartes he calls by the same name body, and make his idea, which he expresses by the word body, to be of a thing that hath both extension and solidity together, he will as easily demonstrate that there may be a vacuum or space without a body, as Descartes demonstrated the contrary, because the idea to which he gives the name space being barely the simple one of extension, and the idea to which he gives the name body being the complex idea of extension and resistibility or solidity together in the same subject, these two ideas are not exactly one and the same, but in the understanding as distinct as the ideas of one and two, white and black, or as of corporeity and humanity, if I may use those barbarous terms, and therefore 
the predication of them in our minds, or in words standing for them, is not identical, but the negation of them, one of another, viz. this proposition, extension, or space, is not body, is as true and evidently certain as this maxim, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, can make any proposition. 14. But they prove not the existence of things without us. But yet, though both these propositions, as you see, may be equally demonstrated, viz. that there may be a vacuum, and that there cannot be a vacuum, by these two certain principles, viz. what is, is, and the same thing cannot be and not be, yet neither of these principles will serve to prove to us that any or what bodies do exist. For that we are left to our senses to discover to us as far as they can, those universal and self-evident principles being only our constant, clear, and distinct knowledge of our own ideas, more general or comprehensive, can assure us of nothing that passes without the mind. Their certainty is founded only upon the knowledge we have of each idea by itself, and of its distinction from others, about which we cannot be mistaken whilst they are in our minds. Though we may be and often are mistaken when we retain the names without the ideas, or use them confusedly, sometimes for one and sometimes for another idea, in which cases the force of these axioms reaching only to the sound and not the signification of the words serves only to lead us into confusion, mistake, and error. It is to show men that these maxims, however cried up for the great guards of truth, will not secure them from error in a careless, loose use of their words that I have made this remark. In all that is here suggested concerning their little use for the improvement of knowledge, or dangerous use in undetermined ideas, I have been far enough from saying or intending they should be laid aside, as some have been too forward to charge me. I affirm them to be truths, self-evident truths, and so cannot be laid aside. As far as their influence will reach, it is in vain to endeavor, nor will I attempt to abridge it. But yet, without any injury to truth or knowledge, I may have reason to think their use is not answerable to the great stress which seems to be laid on them. And I may warn men not to make an ill use of them for the confirming themselves in errors. 15. They cannot add to our knowledge of substances, and their application to complex ideas is dangerous. But let them be of what use they will in verbal propositions, they cannot discover or prove to us the least knowledge of the nature of substances, as they are found and exist without us any further than grounded on experience. And though the consequence of these two propositions, called principles, be very clear, and their use not dangerous or harmful in the probation of such things, wherein there is no need at all of them for proof, but such as are clear by themselves without them, viz. where our ideas are determined and known by the names that stand for them, yet when these principles, viz. what is, is, and it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, are made use of in the probation of propositions wherein are words standing for complex ideas, v.g. man, horse, gold, virtue, there they are of infinite danger and most commonly make men receive and retain falsehood for manifest truth and uncertainty for demonstration, upon which follow error, obstinacy, and all the mischiefs that can happen from wrong reasoning. The reason whereof is not that these principles are less true, or of less force, in proving propositions made of terms standing for complex ideas, 
than where the propositions are about simple ideas, but because men mistake generally, thinking that where the same terms are preserved, the propositions are about the same things, though the ideas they stand for are in truth different. Therefore, these maxims are made use of to support those which in sound and appearance are contradictory propositions, and is clear in the demonstrations above mentioned about a vacuum, so that whilst men take words for things, as usually they do, these maxims may and do commonly serve to prove contradictory propositions, as shall yet be further made manifest. 16. Instance in demonstrations about man which can only be verbal. For instance, let man be that concerning which you would by these first principles demonstrate anything, and we shall see that so far as demonstration is by these principles, it is only verbal and gives us no certain, universal, true proposition or knowledge of any being existing without us. First, a child, having framed the idea of a man, it is probable that his idea is just like that picture which the painter makes of the visible appearances joined together, and such a complication of ideas together in his understanding makes up the single complex idea which he calls man, whereof white or flesh color in England being one, the child can demonstrate to you that a negro is not a man, because white color was one of the constant simple ideas of the complex idea he calls man, and therefore he can demonstrate by the principle, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, that a negro is not a man. The foundation of his certainty being not that universal proposition which perhaps he never heard nor thought of, but the clear distinct perception he hath of his own simple ideas of black and white, which he cannot be persuaded to take, nor can ever mistake, one for another, whether he knows that maxim or no, and to this child or any one who hath such an idea, which he calls man, can you never demonstrate that a man hath a soul, because his idea of man includes no such notion or idea in it? And therefore, to him, the principle of what is, is, proves not this matter, but it depends upon collection and observation, by which he is to make his complex idea called man. 17. Another instance. Secondly, another that hath gone further in framing and collecting the idea he calls man, and, to the outward shape, adds laughter and rational discourse, may demonstrate that infants and changelings are no men. By this maxim, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. And I have discoursed with very rational men who have actually denied that they are men. 18. A third instance. Thirdly, perhaps another makes up the complex idea which he calls man only out of the ideas of body in general, and the powers of language and reason, and leaves out the shape wholly. This man is able to demonstrate that a man may have no hands, but be quadrupes, neither of those being included in his idea of man, and in whatever body or shape he found speech and reason joined that was a man, because having a clear knowledge of such a complex idea, it is certain that what is, is. 19. Little use of these maxims in proofs where we have clear and distinct ideas. So that, if rightly considered, I think we may say that where our ideas are determined in our minds and have annexed to them by us, known and steady names under those settled determinations, there is little need, or no use at all, of these maxims to prove the agreement or disagreement of any of them. He that cannot discern the truth or falsehood of such propositions without the help of these and the like maxims will not be helped by these maxims to do it, 
since he cannot be supposed to know the truth of these maxims themselves without proof, if he cannot know the truth of others without proof, which are as self-evident as these. Upon this ground, it is that intuitive knowledge neither requires nor admits any proof, one part of it more than another. He that will suppose it does takes away the foundation of all knowledge and certainty, and he that needs any proof to make him certain and give his assent to this proposition, that two are equal to two, will also have need of a proof to make him admit that what is, is. He that needs a probation to convince him that two are not three, that white is not black, that a triangle is not a circle, etc., or any other two determined distinct ideas are not one and the same, will need also a demonstration to convince him that it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be. 20. Their use dangerous where our ideas are not determined. And as these maxims are of little use where we have determined ideas, so they are, as I have showed, of dangerous use where our ideas are not determined and where we use words that are not annexed to determined ideas, but such as are of a loose and wandering signification, sometimes standing for one and sometimes for another idea, from which follow mistake and error, which these maxims, brought as proofs to establish propositions, wherein the terms stand for undetermined ideas, do by their authority confirm and rivet. End of section 8. Recording by Jennifer Henry.